Gill netting has been a tradition in the Northwest, and it still provides a living for both commercial and tribal fishermen. But a major problem has surfaced, and it's the fishermen themselves who are taking steps to correct it. The scene is textbook Northwest. Mountain and sky meet above strikingly beautiful rivers and seas. Home to salmon, sturgeon, and other wildlife. Yet beneath the surface, hundreds of lost gill nets, long forgotten, drift aimlessly. They are hidden death traps that fishermen call ghost nets. A lot of times there'll be salmon in them. And a lot of times there'll be just carcasses. Over the years, they'll keep on rotting out, and they'll, they'll keep on getting heavier, and they'll keep on sinking. But uh, they will still be catching fish. That's why we call them ghost nets, because they catch fish all the time. You know. Though gill netting is in decline, it is still practiced in the Northwest by tribes and commercial fishermen. Gill netting is simple. Set out nets, wait, and haul in a catch. Wild steelhead. But a lost net, a ghost net, never stops fishing, never stops killing, becoming a permanent fish trap up to hundreds of feet long. These areas where the logs are is where you find a lot of the nets off these points, these spits. Dale Temke, or Doc as he's better known, is campaigning to rid the Northwest of ghost nets. We started doing this in 1998, and in the five years that we have been doing it, we've removed 70 nets. Okay. Let's see what she is. Doc once spent his days happily fishing and guiding. That all changed once he began experimenting with underwater video cameras. The only reason I built the cameras was I wanted to see how a fish bites a lure. I want to see a fish bite something, you know. And so that's how I started. So I'm on a charter. I'm up in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. It's the pristine area in Washington to salmon fish. All of a sudden, my camera gets hung up in something. I'm not really able to tell what it is. And it's a net. It's just a net floating on its own, tumbling on the bottom in 120 foot of water. And all of a sudden, I start to see that there is a serious problem. Doc was energized and began using cameras to hunt down more wayward ghost nets. He started his search in his own backyard, Hood Canal, Washington. All right, we have a rope off of a tree here that's fallen. And this is what these ghost nets look like. Sometimes they've hooked them to a tree. This would be an area that I'd bring the cameras in and really focus on. It only makes sense that if you see a part of a net here, there's more out there. Doc's cameras are protected by an aerodynamic housing that flies through water. The images are sent instantly to a monitor and recording unit on board his boat. When you take a video and you show a picture of a net laying on the seafloor full of seabirds, full of Dungeness crab, full of rock crab, dead salmon that are on our endangered species list, and you actually show that, then you got something. Fishermen are aware of the problem. Many now call Doc with information about where to find lost nets. Right here, we got a net right there. It's off the bottom, I'm getting a good shot of it. I'm looking at a lot of dead crabs, dead fish. Wow, look at that, there's a bird, there's a bird. When you look out over the Puget Sound or the canal or the Straits, it looks great, but when you get under the water, then it tells a whole different story. Ghost nets are not just a problem on Hood Canal. Declines in native fish in the Columbia River force gill netters to take a hard look at what's happening there. Ghost nets could no longer be ignored. We figure out where the most populated fishing area is, 
Now this area here is, is usually good for losing nets. Charles Gardee is a Yakima Nation gill netter and biologist. He spends the off season recovering ghost nets. You know the fish are declining anyway, especially the white sturgeon. And when you see something like this, you know, you know they're mostly sturgeon, so you're losing some of your livelihood. Cameras don't work well in the murky Columbia River water, so the work here is more tedious. I just GPS where we hooked it. Biologists head into areas traditionally used by gill netters. Then they drop a line with a weighted hook that drags along the river bottom. Oh. This is James Keona's first stab at net recovery. We caught a 16-foot aluminum ladder yesterday. <laughs> we catch motors once in a while, boat motors. There's just about everything man-made ends up out in here. The tribes and states have always thought that there might be a problem. Kevin Kappaman coordinates the recovery effort. He has to find money each year to pay for this time-consuming project. The voices were out there. It's just that we never had the money to initiate a project until now. States historically imposed fines on fishermen who lost gear. But those laws are changing. Fishermen in Oregon can now report most lost nets without fear of a fine. In the old days when they were lost, they were just lost. You know, that's all we were seeing. We try to return them if there's a name on them. At thousands of dollars each, the hope is that some nets can be repaired and reused. A loss of a net to some people is devastation. Some people can't afford a bunch of nets. And 400 foot net will run you just about $2,500. Though the economic toll of a lost net can be heavy, the net's most immediate impact is on rare sturgeon. By their nature, sturgeon are an easy target. Lost nets are at the bottom of the river, typically, and that's where the sturgeon live. Hey, smell something dead. Woohoo, you can smell him. One of the things about sturgeon is they're attracted to scents in the water. So if they smell fish rotting in a net, they'll be attracted to that net. The cycle of death increases in areas with a big tidal fluctuation, as in Hood Canal. Let's just say that there is a net that's abandoned, and then a fish is caught in that net. Well, a crab gets excited about the decomposing fish. It gets caught in the webbing, and then these seabirds come down at low tide, and they start feeding on crabs and the dead fish, and they get caught in the webbing. It's just a cycle that never, ever stops. Doc's videos have raised awareness, and with that, the funds needed to help pay for net removal. Doc now works with local crews to get ghost nets out of the water. But with these images, there is no escaping the brutal reality of the ghost net problem. You gotta get it now. You can't be going into a meeting with your GPS coordinates and say this is where it's at, this is what we wanna do. Uh-uh. You gotta get it. Because every day that net sits in the water, it's killing something new. Gill netting still continues because it provides an economy and food for the tribes and commercial gill netters. One on this side. Yet each season, more nets are lost, meaning there will always be more nets to recover. I think these nets have a lot to do with a lot of impact on this river. Even two weeks, you know, if we, if we get 10 nets, we're going to save thousands of fish. Woohoo! Look at him go! Look at him go! This past summer, Columbia River tribes recovered 25 nets. And next year, tribes and various wildlife agencies hope to expand their efforts to other bays, rivers, and estuaries.